Hi, welcome back to Earth Materials. Today I would like to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is metamorphism. I'm first going to talk about processes of metamorphism, where we find metamorphic rocks forming on Earth today, some of the systematics of metamorphic mineral assemblages and metamorphic grade, specifically barrow zones. I want to talk a little bit about metamorphic field gradients and a little bit about protoliths. I want to spend a little time talking about the aluminous silicates and storolite structure. And then last, I want to finish with the metamorphic facies. So at the end of this lecture, I hope students will be able to have a better understanding about how and where metamorphic rocks form, to say something about how mineral assemblages can reflect conditions of metamorphism, identify some typical metamorphic rocks and minerals, say something about the basic structure and characteristics of aluminous silicates and then have a good understanding of the metamorphic facies and the characteristic mineral assemblages of those facies. Okay, how do metamorphic rocks form? Well, in metamorphic petrology, we often describe the conditions of metamorphism in reference to a pressure versus temperature diagram. So this is pressure in kilobars. 10 kilobars is about 35 kilometers depth in the crust. Typical metamorphic temperatures range from about three or 400 degrees C up to eight or 900 degrees C. What we used to do was talk about what's called the metamorphic field gradient. So if you go out in the field and you start in some area and you walk in a particular direction, you may find minerals that form at higher and higher and higher temperatures and pressures. That is, they're not stable at lower temperatures and pressures. And you see that as you walk in a particular direction, the pressures and temperatures increase. This is called the metamorphic field gradient. When you're in the field, there is a gradient in metamorphic grade. And in general, these gradients fall into three very broad classes. There's a low pressure series called a Buchan series, characteristic of arc metamorphism. There's a high pressure series, which is characteristic of subduction zones. And then there is a Barovian metamorphic field gradient, which is characteristic of continent-continent collisions. I want to emphasize the metamorphic field gradient is where metamorphic rocks tend to equilibrate during whatever process it is that forms them. That doesn't say how they got there. And so whereas metamorphic pressure temperature paths might be kind of similar to the metamorphic field gradient for a subduction zone or an arc, it's been shown repeatedly that the pressure temperature paths that give rise to Barovian metamorphic field gradients look very different from this particular distribution of pressures and temperatures. So when we look at subduction zones, there are two main places where metamorphic rocks form. So here's our subducting slab. As it goes down, it catalyzes partial melting of the mantle, which creates a volcanic arc over here. These lines are isotherms. So this is the depth in the crust where the temperature is 300 degrees C, and it comes down like that. This is the depth in the crust where the temperature is 600 degrees and so on. And so we typically talk about two different areas. There's this region, which has relatively low temperatures and high pressures, and this region that has relatively high temperatures and low pressures. This is characteristic of a subduction zone. This is characteristic of a volcanic arc. And we can see this paired metamorphism in many ancient subduction zones. Here, for example, is Japan. There is the San Bagawa metamorphic belt. San Bagawa is high pressure rocks, low temperatures. So that's the subduction zone rocks. And then there's the Abakuma metamorphic belt, which is shown here. Those are high temperature, low pressure rocks. Those are the arc rocks. If we look in the Western United States, so here is San Francisco, there is a whole series of metamorphic rocks in the Franciscan formation. These are all high pressure, low temperature rocks. They continue down here as well. Sitting over here is the Sierra Nevada Arc, which contains low pressure, high temperature rocks. So here again is the paired metamorphic belt, the Franciscan formation and the Sierra Nevada Arc and contact metamorphic rocks around it.
Here are examples of rocks that form in subduction zones. They are characteristically blue schists and eclogites. So here the blue is blue amphibole glaucophane. These light colored crystals are lawsonite, which is a high pressure, low temperature mineral. Here's what a blue schist looks like in thin section. Lots of blue amphibole. These are garnets here. This is an eclogite, red garnet, green, sodium rich clinopyroxene. And here is an eclogite in thin section with a garnet and this green clinopyroxene again. In continent-continent collisions where one continental plate is colliding with another continental plate, there's a whole region of overthickened crust. And in this region, all of these rocks are metamorphic. Here's an example of the Indo-Asian collision. So here's the continent of India, which is colliding with Asia. And you can see there's lots of tectonic activity, lots of thrust faults running through here. And it's in these regions of overthickened crust that we see lots and lots of metamorphic rocks. So for example, here is a close up of, of this region and we see these rocks of the Lesser Himalayan and Greater Himalayan sequences. These are all metamorphic rocks. The Tethian Himalayan has variable metamorphism, but these, these nice domes up here, these are all metamorphic rocks. So these were all buried under the mountain belt, thrust forward and exhumed to expose at the surface. It's also true that there's metamorphism that occurs at spreading ridges. So we normally think about mid-ocean ridges in terms of their igneous processes. And that's really important for understanding Earth evolution. But the heat from upwelling and magmatic activity also induces a lot of hydrothermal activity. And this hydrothermal activity causes metamorphic reactions to occur in the shallow to deep crust. And so in fact, much of the oceanic crust here, although it is fundamentally started by igneous processes, can also be considered largely metamorphic. So in fact, much of the crust of the Earth, the oceanic crust, continental crust that's been reworked by collisional orogenesis and so on, much of the crust is metamorphic. OK, let's look at some metamorphic rocks. Here is a very low metamorphic rock. This is a slate. Slates are incipiently crystallized. They have this characteristic slaty cleavage that means they split into thin plates that can be used to make houses, as in this example. There are other useful metamorphic rocks. Here's marble, Michelangelo's David. Marble is a metamorphic rock. Ice, it kind of depends on how it forms. If it forms by the compaction of snow that then recrystallizes, then it's a metamorphic rock. And people talk about snow metamorphism. On the other hand, if it's, say, ice that crystallizes out of a lake, then it would, I guess it would be considered an igneous rock. Unless it recrystallizes, then it would be considered a metamorphic rock. Some of the typical rocks that we talk about include schists. Schists have a foliation to them, meaning that they split preferentially along planes of weakness. The planes of weakness are usually defined by micas. So this is a very micaceous schist. It has big sprays of black amphibole in it, large garnets here with a penny for scale. Gneisses are coarse-grained, high-temperature rocks. This is a characteristic gneiss called an Augen gneiss. Alga is the German word for eye. And so these deformed K feldspar crystals are thought to look a little bit like eyes. And so that's what gives rise to the name Augen gneiss. Calcilicates are calcium silica rich rocks. Here's a beautiful calcilicate from the contact oriel of the Adamello intrusion. This is actually a basaltic dike that's been pulled apart. But these thin layers here are very silica rich. The lighter colored layers in between are very calcite rich. And so we're seeing alternating marble calcilicate, marble calcilicate. And clearly, the, the deformation has created a very spectacular pattern here. This is a massive quartzite from Great Smoky Mountains National Park. These are metamorphosed sandstones. OK, quick question. Where would you not expect metamorphic rocks to form on Earth in general?
And the answer, I would say, is at Earth's surface, it's, there are metamorphic rocks that form at Earth's surface. There are meteorite impacts that create high pressure minerals. Pyrometamorphism, sometimes coal seams catch on fire and they create metamorphic minerals. Lava flows create contact effects and, and so on. But they're pretty rare. Metamorphic rocks are very common in subduction zones at mid-ocean ridges. Like I said, there's a lot of hydrothermal activity there. They're common in plate collisions, and they also form in arcs. I realize arcs are largely igneous in origin, but they do have these contact metamorphic effects that create metamorphic rocks. Okay, now I hope we have a better understanding of how and where metamorphic rocks form.